Good morning, Trinity. How are you this morning? Staying warm? <laughs> uh, I, love, I love the coldness. It's so good. Um, Tuesday evening, uh, we'll be having our, our Bible study that we do every week. Uh, we're working through the Psalms. Uh, this Tuesday, we're working on Psalm 40, which is a, a wonderful Psalm. If you want to know a little bit more about it, Come on out. It's a, always a great discussion and a, and a wonderful time of prayer afterwards. Um, so if you just want to know more about the Psalms, come on out on Tuesday evening at 6.30. I believe we are looking for some soup makers. Are we not, Cornelia? Yeah. Is anybody willing to volunteer to make soup for the soup and bun on the last? Oh, there you go. Perfect. So the last Sunday of the month, I think it's the 20, 28th, right? Uh, it's our, our soup and bun. Uh, it's a time where we can have just great fellowship and great food. Um, and so, um, yeah, it's going to be a great time. So uh, make sure you plan to stay after service because we're going to enjoy each other and uh, have a great time of fellowship. There's a, a wonderful passage in, in uh, Romans which Paul writes, and I want you to kind of pay attention to it. Here's what it says. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? Is, or it is God who justifies, who is, or who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he, who, or who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us, who shall se separate us from the love of Christ, 
shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. As it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long and we are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. May that ring well to your hearts today, this morning. Uh, may I have the gentleman come forward for our offering? Let's pray, shall we? Father God, we just thank you for the coldness. We thank you that you bring us a a sense of new freshness, something that we can talk about and enjoy. It's all a blessing of you, and we give you praise for it, Lord. Father, I pray that uh, you continue to work in in our hearts here at Trinity. Um, We we pray that you continue to mold us into your image uh, and just create in us a good work. Father, take this offering and use it for your purposes, for your kingdom, and may you multiply it and may you be glorified through it. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Richard. Let's stand as we sing two hymns and a chorus. If you want to follow along in the hymn book, it's hymn number 122. I like this particular hymn because it takes us from Christmas through to the cross. And then we'll sing more about the cross. Tell me the story of Jesus. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tempted, 
Yet was triumphant at last. Tell of the years of his labor. Tell of the sorrow he bore. He was despised and reflected, homeless, rejected, and story of Jesus write on my heart every word tell me the story most precious sweetest that ever was heard tell of the cross where they nailed him writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him. Tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus. Write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Have you been to the cross where the Lord Jesus suffered? Have you been to Calvary? Have you been to the place of redemption for sinners? Have you been to Calvary. It was there on Calvary, God's dear Son lay down His life for you. While this time don't delay, place your faith in Christ Jesus, turn your eyes now to Calvary. You can search, you can buy, and try everything man-made, but it cannot satisfy. It is Christ, only Christ, who gives life more abundant, and he calls from Calvary. It was there on Calvary, God's dear Son lay down his life, Father's time, don't delay, place your faith in Christ Jesus, turn your eyes now to Calvary. While the Spirit's clear voice can be heard softly pleading, Give your life to Jesus now. Trusting faith is the way to have life everlasting. And he calls from Calvary. It was
was there on Calvary, God's dear Son lay down His life for you. Now there's time, don't delay, place your faith in Christ Jesus. Turn your eyes now to Calvary. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to Take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your Grade sixes and under, you may head off. I think Miss Mia is going to lead you in Trinity Kids this morning. As you go, we're going to pray for you. Let's pray, shall we? Father God, Lord, you know my heart when it comes to these kids, these children. I pray that you continue to to pour your spirit upon them, Lord, that you rise up leaders that can radically change, and change our culture and our world, Lord. Father, I pray for us in this room, and I pray that um, we come humbly before your throne, that we understand what you want of us through this passage that we're dealing with today. Lord, may you be gracious to us and help us uh, focus on you and what is right and what is good and to give you glory in all things. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Two weeks ago, as we ended the year, we really talked about um, a sense of faith. And we defined faith as a helpless surrender. And based on experience and knowledge, over time, we build this trust and this confidence in what God is doing. Essentially, God works. We experience God work. Therefore, when we come into a problem or a situation or just a general understanding of God, we know that God is there. And that is what faith is. It's a helpless surrender to knowing that God is there. Last week, we, we worked on forgiveness, and, and we were humbled by the sense that, that we all need forgiveness. There, we're really not good people, right? In, in our hearts, there's always something that, is, that, is struggle, or that we're struggling with that's causing chaos in our hearts, and, and we try to put it on that front, and the reality is we're neither the, the woman that came to Jesus or the Pharisee that was speaking out. We're somewhere in between and we need help. Uh, today, we're going to continue that theme of really base, breaking down faith and what faith is. Today, we're, we're working through the, the chapter of Luke 9. So you can turn there if you want in your Bibles. It's a wonderful uh, chapter of, or portion of Scripture that we're going to be working through, but one that will challenge the hearts of us. It will challenge everything we know about what we believe. Uh, and it's designed to do that because it is Jesus' very words to us. When we talk about discipleship, usually when we come to the understanding of what discipleship is, it's more of a give-and-take contraction. 
We kind of approach God and say, God, I am the best there is. I have this, 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 this to offer you. So you're into the bargain. You're going to make my life comfortable. You're going to make, make sure I'm well. And you're going to do all these good things to make me do well. And we kind of come up to God as a contraction. Where it's, it's, if he doesn't uphold his end of the deal, we're free to break ours. And we kind of, kind of go along that route. Today we're going to actually look at what discipleship is. Chances are we're all getting it wrong in some way, shape, or form. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of, one of the greatest guys when he writes on discipleship, he actually writes a whole book called The Cost of Discipleship, and he breaks down what discipleship means. And he really argues a, a point that the church is not getting it right. In a secondary book to The Cost of Discipleship, he kind of expands on what he wrote in the first. And the second book's called Discipleship. Here's what he says. He says, A Christianity that no longer took discipleship seriously remade the gospel into only the solace of cheap grace. Interesting words that Bonhoeffer would use. And we would really have to define what cheap grace is and how he defines it. He says, cheap grace is thus denial of God's living word, denial of the incarnation of the word of God. Cheap grace means justification of sin, but not the sinner. Because grace alone does everything, everything can stay in its old ways. Our action is in vain. The world remains, uh, the world remains would and we remain sinners. Even in the best of lives, thus the Christian should live the same way the world does. In all things, the Christian should go along with the world and not venture to live a different life under grace from that under sin. For, for Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he sees cheap grace as this really um, mom, this moment where Christians approach the, the throne of grace for what they receive. What they get and what they benefit from the throne of grace. It's like going to a father when you're a child and saying, Daddy, I want a million dollars. And Daddy opens up his wallet and gives you a million dollars. And then the next day you go and, Daddy, I want a brand new car. And Daddy opens up his wallets and he goes and buys you a brand new car. And the third day you go, Daddy, I want a house. And Daddy opens up his wallet, gives a house. It's a lopsided transaction where the individual is just constantly going to God for what he gains and never really giving God anything, not even a thank you. Dietrich Bonhoeffer defines cheap grace like that, and he argues that most of the church approaches God in that way. Makes you think, have I approached God in that way lately? Have I just been cheapening out on grace and what grace actually means? The reality is there's two types of Christians, and perhaps there's two types of Christians even in this room, and there are those of cheap grace who really are Christians because of what God does for them. They, they make grace a means of comfort. They take the benefits of Christ. In doing so, they reject any hardship or lifestyle that Christ commands. It's not about following Christ, rather using Him for their comfort. That's, that's the, those that are following the ways of cheap grace and Dietrich Bonhoeffer, he argues about costly grace. It's those Christians that understand grace. It's understanding what Christ is calling them to be. What Christ is calling them to do. It's a, a, faith, a faith that is without sacrifice and a willful surrender is really not a faith at all. It's a means of comfort. And costly grace says, I am going to give everything I have 
to please God. So there's these two types of Christians in Dietrich Bonhoeffer's mindset. The majority are those that chase after cheap grace just for the comforts of what Christ brings them. There's others who understand the cost. I want to give you a context before we get into our passage this morning. Just before our passage, Peter, he has a, just a heartfelt moment. You see, Peter is in this moment and he's seeing Christ Jesus do miracles of magnificent sorts. And he has this dialogue with Jesus. Jesus asks him, who do people say I am? Through this dialogue, it comes to this point where Jesus Christ specifically asks Peter, Peter, who do you say I am? Peter's response, his confession is, you are the Christ of God. You are the Christ of God. Wow. That's a, that's a bold confession that Peter's making. Especially for a Jewish individual. He does not take that lightly. The, the reality is, when Jesus or Peter says, you are the Christ of God, Jesus does not correct him. Right? Jesus knows the full cost of what that means to be the Christ of God. And he doesn't take a moment to correct Peter and say, Peter, that's not exactly what I mean. If Jesus knows the full weight of being the Christ of God, knowing full well that's going to lead to his death, all it would take is a simple word by Jesus and saying, let's get this one straight, Peter. Let's, let's get this correct. He does not do that. He does not correct Peter, which means he is, a, he is affirming what Peter says in this moment. So he is saying that he is the Christ of God, the one that is to come to rescue and redeem the world. The second thing we want to know about this confession Peter's confession was so powerful, but he had an understanding of a worldly saving of a life. You see, for Peter, Christ meant the, the release from exile, the release from the oppression of the Romans and all the oppression of the opposing governments. It was a warlike figure that was going to come and rescue them and save their life. And we see this, that Peter's understanding of this, sad part is, Peter confesses that Jesus Christ is Christ of God later on when there's a moment of challenge for Peter he actually reneges on this confession and he actually denies Christ three times and it's this moment where we find ourselves all the time where we confess Jesus as Christ as the Christ of God and in other moments we deny him the third thing is this military conquest Peter is willing to go to battle for Christ. And we see this in this moment of Jesus being arrested and the high priest's servant comes and Peter cuts off the ear. For some way, shape, or form, Peter's just not getting what the Christ actually is, though he confesses it fully with his heart. He denies Christ in times and he goes into a military stance and he starts chopping off the ear of the high priest's servant. He just doesn't get it. Though his words are actual proclamation confession of Jesus being the Christ. Lastly, when we look at this confession of Jesus, 
when Jesus follows up Peter's confession, he radically changes it and he says, hey Peter, I am the Christ. You have agreed to that. You're going to come and you're going to deny me. You're going to think that I'm a militant. You know what, Peter? There's going to come a time where I'm going to suffer and die. I'm going to come and I'm going to stand in front of priests and and leaders and rulers and they are going to reject me. Peter, I'm going, to, I'm going to die and I'm going to suffer. Could you imagine being Peter in this moment? You just literally confessed with your mouth that Jesus is Christ. You're not knowing that you're going to deny him. You're not knowing that you're going to take up a sword for him. You're so confused And the Messiah of the world, the Christ of the world, the one that's going to come to redeem the people of the world is going to die. That's powerful. That's a powerful moment. He's going to go to a cross and he's going to die for us. That's life-shaking for a Jewish individual of the first century. The Messiah was not to die according to Jewish thought, Jewish tradition. They were the warrior king that was to release them from the oppression of the opponents. So Peter in this moment has these four kind of concepts. The reality is Peter missed much of the meaning of our passage of being Christ. And sadly, many of us do as well. We are like Peter in a lot of ways. We look to Christ as if he cannot help but want us on his team. As if we are God's greatest gift to Christ and the transaction becomes something like this. If we give Christ our allegiance, then he should be happy we are on his team. That he should give us comfort, favor, whatever we want, We treat him like a genie in a bottle. After all, he would be missing out if we were not on his team. That's how we treat God. I I was watching the news of our our favorite team, the Maple Leafs, and uh, one of their their players, William Nylander, who I would suggest is probably just a B-level player, um, just signed a contract for $8 million a year. And he went to the Leafs management and he said, I am so great. I do this, 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 this. And he starts listing off all the great things he does for the team. And then he says, I will continue to do this for you, but you have to give me $8 million. That's the way we approach God. We say, God, I'm going to do this. I'm going to show up on a Sunday service. Maybe to another event throughout the week. And I might look at your words maybe maybe three times a week. For all that, you better give me everything I need. My comfort, money in the bank, a nice family, no struggles, no trials. And we approach God as if it's a contract. Peter in his confession, was approaching God like a contract. He was approaching God for what he can gain out of the transaction. So we come to our text today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke 6. Or sorry, Luke 9. And here's what it says starting at verse 23. And he, Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy, holy angels. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of 
God. May God add a portion of blessing to us as we try to understand what Jesus is actually saying to us in this passage. So we understand the context. Peter just confessed that he is Christ. He's looking at it from a contractual standpoint of what God is going to do for him. Jesus says, hey, I want to radically change your understanding of what the Messiah is. The Messiah is going to die. It's going to be vicious. It's going to be painful. I'm going to die for you. Then he says, Peter, all of you who are listening, if anyone come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily and follow me. Jesus is really painting a picture of what the cost of discipleship is in this moment. What it means to be a Christian. So we've looked at faith, we've looked at forgiveness of sins, and Jesus now is saying, here is what a Christian looks like, a follower of me. First one is deny yourself. It's arneomai. It's the word that, that the Greek is using here. and It really is to think not of yourself as alpha. Alpha is number one. That's literally what arneomai, or arneomai speaks of. Think not yourself as number one. So when we deny ourselves, we lower us and we exalt him. It becomes a military term and it's referencing a a ability to fight as a unit for a king. In military battle, there is no individual. It's always fought as a unit, as a a group of soldiers coming together, serving the king. So when we look at denying yourself, there's really four things that we want to talk about and briefly discuss. The first is surrendering willfully ourselves to Christ. And we understand that's faith. The second is to serve Jesus because he is Christ God, not for what he does for us. Yes, forgiveness, mercy, grace, and other blessings are all wonderful things, but they should never be the causation of our worship of Jesus. Our worship should be simply there because Jesus is God. Jesus demands us to worship him, not because of what he gives us, but because he is God. The the third is that we are to submit to Christ in all things, our obedience and our lifestyle. And fourthly, to lower ourselves as below alpha standard. It's a sacrifice. We sacrifice our own wants and our desires. And the reality is it does not have to be our way. We put ourselves in a position where we are merely servants of God and we follow Him for what He is doing. We worship Him because He is God. That's really what it means to deny ourselves in this context. And so Jesus is saying, hey, if you are battling with me, you probably don't know me. That's all. A hard word that he is saying. Deny yourself. If you are in a battle of putting yourself in front of me, you probably do not know me. You are probably not a disciple of me. That's the first key to what a disciple is. is somebody that is literally putting God in the rightful place within their lives. The second is take up your cross daily. Again, it's a military term, and it was to take up as referencing the picking up of a shield and a sword and readying yourself for battle. So Jesus says, take up your cross. Ready yourself for the cross. We know that the cross was the means of death, a painful execution. It was... Something that you would not ever want. After a few hours on the cross and your muscles are weak because you're 
nerves and your muscles have been penetrated by nails and you're sitting there and you can't hold yourself up anymore. And your breath starts to de- uh, fade from your body because you are suffocating by your own weight. It's a terrible way to die. So Jesus is not saying take up a sword or a shield and ready yourself for battle, but take up your cross. Be willing to die for Christ. Jesus Christ, he himself went to the cross. And later on in Luke, and Luke does it wonderfully, he mentions this 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 Messiah sacrificing and being willing to die for the people about 11 times in the book of Luke. And the last time, in the last chapter of Luke, he actually says why. And the reason why Jesus goes to the cross for the people is for the forgiveness of sins and repentance. It's a wonderful way that he does it. And he builds this anticipation up through the entire book of Luke of why the Messiah needs to go and die. And he ends off the book of Luke in one of the last, or in the last chapter of Luke, one of the last verses of Luke. The Messiah is going to die for forgiveness and repentance. So Jesus Christ goes to the most painful death imaginable for forgiveness and repentance. He's saying, take up your cross for forgiveness and repentance. Take up your cross for forgiveness and repentance. A Christian's life is given wholly, solely for forgiveness and repentance for themselves, but also as a witness to others. In this, we become active agents of grace even unto death. So my question Serious question. A Christian becomes an agent of grace. In the last week, have you told anybody about the gospel of Jesus Christ? That is literally what it means to take up, the, take up your cross. You are active agents for forgiveness and repentance. You are to tell others of Christ. Not just occasionally. It says daily. Daily we are to take up our cross. We are to lower ourselves, deny ourselves, serve God wholeheartedly, and lift up our battle tools. Forgiveness and repentance. That's the second key to discipleship that Jesus defines for us. The first is service of Him, surrendering to Him, submission to Him. The the second is that we take up forgiveness and repentance and we go throughout the world and we tell people of it. It's a continual serious matter and it needs to be a daily activity. Most of us are afraid to do that. Most of us are fearful that somebody's going to think bad of us when we tell them about Jesus Christ. That's the reality of it. We are so ashamed of Christ that we are fearful to actually tell others of Him. The third part of discipleship is follow me. Again, it's a military term and it's this concept of being loyal to the commander and doing what he wants of you. In a military sense, if you are following the commander, if you are loyal to him, you will do what he asks. You, you see, this, in this moment, Jesus himself is telling Peter and those disciples that are around him, there is a greater cost 
It's not about your comfort. It's not about your possessions. It's not about the blessings that God has given you. It is a missional cost. To follow someone is to take their mission and their purpose. To imitate them in their intentions. We have to ask the question, well, how do we know the mission of Christ? And that's through Scripture. You learn His ways, His wants, and His characters through Scripture. And you use Scripture to to reach those in our world. Follow me becomes this, this sense of leaving all your comforts behind. Peter was probably pretty well off as a head fisherman. Matthew was well off because he was a tax collector. Many of their disciples were sufficient in society. They had the comforts of man. When Jesus says, follow me, they immediately dropped their nets. They dropped their pens. They dropped everything that provided for them. All their comfort. And they literally left it all for Christ. That's really what it means to follow me is to drop everything that you think is going to provide you with goodness in this world and follow Christ. Now, before I get letters, I'm not saying that that stuff is bad. I'm not saying that cars and houses and and money in the bank account is bad. But it's this willingness, this sense that there is something greater in life than you and your comforts. It's a sense that you are you willing to go to the ends of the world to show people the gospel of Christ. That's really where we need to be as disciples of Christ. Is willing to place it all in the trash and follow Him wherever He wants us to go. You've heard the stories of people leaving the Western world and going on the remote places in Africa and, and, and the Amazon jungle and all these different things. One of my favorites is a guy by the name of Hudson Taylor. He left England and he left a lavish life in England and he went to China where he literally had nothing. And he lived amongst the Chinese people for a period of time and he learnt their ways. And he realized he had to go much further than just going. He had to become like them in order to reach them. That's what it means to follow me in the terms of Christ. Is we have to be willing to go to the ends of the world on a mission to serve Christ the very way He wants us to serve Him. In the last chapter of the book of Matthew, Jesus says, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey. And in the context, He, goes, he says, go to the ends of the world. No matter what it costs, go. A disciple in Jesus' context makes disciples. So we have the first part is that we deny ourselves and we put God in His rightful place. The second is that we take up our shield of forgiveness and our sword of repentance and we go and we ready ourselves for battle. And then the third is that we actually do it. A disciple makes disciples. Pretty cool in that context, right? Pretty cool in that context. The hard truth is, for us in the Western Christianity, the hard truth is we like to make our excuses. It's too cold on a Sunday morning to get out of bed. So I'm not going to church. How many had that thought this morning? We, we love our comforts. 
Sometimes we get embarrassed. I can't believe Christ actually is making me go and talk to that person in the food court. Sometimes we actually think that we're doing good and that we don't need to deny ourselves to take up our cross and to follow him. Sometimes we think that we're actually doing it well. This is a problem of North American church. We're, we're kind of lazy in this. We're kind of lazy disciples. The reality is we show up to church once, once a week and we put a, a happy, smiley face on and then the rest of the, the week, Christ is not there. We're kind of lazy disciples. So we just think we're too good for it. Sometimes we convince ourselves that we do not need to do it. We do not need to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Eh, they'll hear it some other word, or some other way. The, the reality is in, in Western North America, in, in Western Christianity, we really love cheap grace. We, we love Bonhoeffer's cheap grace. A cheap grace where we really don't have to do anything. We just show up and make God give us all his blessings. We just show up and say, hey God, I, I, I love what you give me. I love your forgiveness and your grace and your mercy. But don't, don't require me to go and do stuff with it. I love the salvation that you give me for myself, but don't require me to do anything for it. To, to go out into the world and reach people. That's the reality. That's, that's the hard truth that many of us in North America, Christianity, we experience that. That's, we, we, we kind of barter with God and we go to God as a, a contract and we say, God, I'm the best Christian there is. I know everything there is to know about the Bible. I know everything there is to know about you. I am the best to have on your team. But the reality is, we spend most of the time in a penalty box. Just soaking it all in. Because we just don't want to do what he wants us to do. That's the sad truth. And that's the reason why the North American church is struggling. It's estimated that there's 4,000 churches this year, 2024, that will close its doors. In North America. 4,000 churches. Why? Because we're lazy Christians. We're not willing to go to the ends of the world to reach people for the gospel of Christ. Jesus' idea of discipleship is deny yourself, take up your cross daily, follow me. They aren't just commands. They, they're not just commands that Jesus gives us. They are the absolute description of a disciple of Jesus. It is the, des the description of what Jesus calls us to be. Christians live to be second to God. Christians are agents of grace. We're, we're agents of forgiveness and repentance. Christians are on a mission for Christ in his kingdom. Amen. True discipleship is about literally the kingdom of God. Remember, we've been talking about the kingdom of God the last couple of weeks through faith and forgiveness. Discipleship is about the kingdom of God. Now, Christ does give us a warning here. And, and when Christ gives us warnings, it's a serious matter. So the warning here is that if someone does not do these things, they're ashamed of him, they will not be, are not a part of his kingdom, for he will be ashamed of them. Wow. That's a hard warning that Christ gives us as the church. If we are ashamed to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, to follow Him, 
He will be ashamed of us. And the word ashamed it literally means to turn your back away from. To, to cover your eyes in embarrassment of. Discipleship is not the cause of salvation. Rather, salvation is the cause of discipleship. If you are saved, Jesus has ransomed your life to be his disciple, and you are on a mission for his kingdom. He gives a kind of a clarifying statement, and and our non-Christian friends love this one verse, and they pull it out of this verse. And he says, some of those who are standing here will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And our non-Christian friends, they love this one because they say, gotcha! Christ hasn't returned yet and people died. Your Bible's false. Have you heard that argument before? That's what they say. They will pull this verse and they'll say, yep, see, the kingdom of God isn't here yet. Christ hasn't returned. People have died. His disciples have died. Done. You think that's true? You think they got us on that one? So, is it talking about the end times? Some people suggest it's talking about his resurrection. Um, and, and the disciples were able to stay and meet his resurrection. I don't see neither of those in this text. Um, I don't see that it's an end time talking where, where Jesus is talking about his future coming. I don't see it as a, 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 an understanding of the resurrection where Jesus is saying, hey, at the resurrection, that's when you will see the kingdom of God. And, and there's a reason why I, I don't see that. And I'll, I'll explain it, but we're, we're going to look at that a little bit more. Matthew 16, uh, verse 18. It says, it's the, the kind of the parallel passage to this, okay? To this, this one verse. It's the parallel passage of Matthew. And it says, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. The difference is the word coming in. Do you see that? The Luke one kind of leaves that out. But the Matthew one has that in there. And that's the key to understanding that one verse. Coming in, it means to draw the battle lines. It means to proceed towards battle. It begins with the preparation of the prince coming for the battle. That's literally what it means, is that the the prince is getting ready to go to war. So he's preparing himself to go into the coming lines, the the battle lines. And so the prince is getting hyped up. He's usually seeking counsel of how to defeat the enemy. He's usually starting to talk to the older men of the city and saying, hey, this is my first battle. You've been through it before. How do I do this? How do I lead the people into battle? It's usually the job of the prince because the king was too valuable. He could not usually go to battle. He would usually stay off in the distance to watch the battle. But the prince would lead the charge. And so his nerves are going. He's ramping himself up and he's asking questions. If you've ever started a new job, you know what that feels like. The nerves running rampant in you and you're feeling lost and the, the people around you seem to know what they're doing and you just ask them questions. That's what's going on in the coming in. And so during this preparation, this, this battle that's ready to begin, the prince seeks out this counsel of the people, of the leaders of Israel. The cool thing is, right after our text this morning where Jesus says deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me there's a moment 
a wonderful moment that Christ experiences. And it's literally something called the transfiguration. And it's this moment where Jesus is seen speaking with Moses and Elijah. And after the transfiguration, a dove comes down from heaven and Christ is inaugurated as the Prince King. The one that comes into battle. The flow of Luke really defines it clearly for us because Peter's confession of Christ, thinking full well that it's a warrior king, that one that's going to release them from the oppression of the Romans. Jesus says, no, no, the, the, the king's going to die. If you are his disciple, you're going to deny yourself. You're going to take up your cross, follow him, even to death yourself. Now let's go to battle. That's the flow of Luke. He's saying, let's go to battle, church. <laughs> Now the king is in this moment of transfiguration and the prince is getting himself ready and he's talking to Moses and Elijah saying, hey, what do I need to do? And this inauguration of the prince readying himself for battle happens. So now we're starting to see Peter's Messiah. The battle is about to rage and it's going to start. You know what happens next? Do you know what happens next in the story? And, and the way Luke portrays it? <laughs> Jesus sends out 72 disciples. And he says, hey, you guys are a part of the battle. Your job now is to go tell people about forgiveness and repentance. You have all the tools you need. It's your job to go throughout the world, prepare people for the life Jesus has for them. That's the flow of Luke. Pretty amazing, right? And he, he ends in that moment where he sends out 72 disciples and he says, go do your job. Prepare the people's hearts for me and my kingdom. That's a pretty, pretty bold move. A battle line has formed and guess what? We are part of the battle. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his book, Discipleship, he, he says, costly grace is the hidden treasure in the field for the sake of which people go and sell with joy everything they have. It is the costly pearl for whose price the merchant sells all that he has. It is Christ's sovereignty for the sake of which you tear out an eye if it causes you to stumble. It is the call of Jesus Christ which causes a disciple to leave his nets and follow him. Costly grace is the gospel which must be sought again and again. The gift which has to be asked for. The poor at which one has to knock. It is costly because it calls to discipleship. It is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It is costly because it costs people their lives. It is grace because it, is, it thereby makes them live. It is costly because it condemns sin. It is grace because it justifies the sinner. Above all, grace is costly because it was costly to God. Because it costs God the life of His Son. Where are we at, church? Are we on mission? Are we in the battle lines receiving costly grace? Or are we just cheaping it out? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your words this morning. Humbling words to deny ourselves, to take up our cross and follow you. For centuries, it costs people their lives. 
men like William Tyndale and um, John Wycliffe who translated Scripture into English. And for that, they were executed. Men like Hudson Taylor who gave all his comforts away to live in the wilderness of China. For Jim Elliott who lost his life in Ecuador. For, for centuries, men and women have literally given everything they had for you to serve you in the battle. May that be so with us. May we reject the comforts of life and give everything we have to serve you. May we be true disciples, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. ask you to stand and sing a rather old hymn uh, based on a poem written to expand on Luke 9.23. I'll remind you that we also have communion following this and after communion we have a business meeting. So those who are members, please stay behind. I my cross have taken all to leave and follow thee destitute despised forsaken thou from hence my all shall be perish every fond ambition all I've sought or hoped or known, yet how rich is my condition, Lord, and have Lord still my own. Let the world despise and leave me, they have left my sin. Oh. Uh -huh.